Good evening, everybody. How are you doing? <laughs> good, good. It's uh, great to have you here. On behalf of FIU, you're all welcome, students, guests, uh, <coughs> our friend here in Mary Helen Imorino. Uh, today, we will be t she will be uh, presenting uh, Embodied Brains, Social Minds, and Emotional Cultural Self. Before we start talking about her, uh, I'm going to give uh, Dr. Perkins uh, the microphone. Dr. Perkins is the Associate Dean at the College of Education, and he is also representing the Dean who was not able to come to this lecture due to uh, trouble in arrangements. So welcome, uh, Dr. Perkins. Thank you, Angela. Welcome, folks. Um, Dean Garcia is in Washington, D.C. at a national meeting on a very important topic called teacher retention. So uh, she picked somebody who is the slowest talker in the College of Education to introduce our very distinguished guest. And indeed, we do have a very, very distinguished, distinguished guest with us tonight. Dr. Mary Helen Emerdino Yang is an affective neuroscientist, as well as a human development psychologist. For those of us who dabble in the black arts of second language acquisition, the affective domain is something that we are well aware of. The subject matter that she studies is long, and that includes the neural, the psychophysiological, as well as the psychological bases of social emotion, self-awareness, and culture, and the implications of these constructs for the development, for development and schools. She is an assistant professor of education, psychology, and neuroscience at the Brain and Creative Institute at the University of Southern California. She began her professional career as a public junior high school science teacher. Notice that she still has a full head of hair. <laughs> from there, she earned her doctorate from Harvard in human development and psychology. That was in 2005. She completed her postdoc training in social affective neuroscience with Antonio Damasio in 2008. In 2010, she and her collaborators were awarded the Cozzarelli Prize for their paper titled Neural Correlates of Admiration and Compassion. And that prize was awarded to our speaker and her colleagues by the editorial board of the National Academy of Sciences. As you can see, as you can hear from that, she deals in very high-level organizations, and the list gets longer. She also holds a career award from the National Science Foundation. In 2011, she was named a rising star by the Association for Psychological Science. She received an honor coin from the United States Army. She also received a commendation from the County of Los Angeles for her work on compassion education. She also is the inaugural recipient of the International Mind, Brain, and Education Society's Award for Transforming Education Through Neuroscience. 2014 has been a very good year for this young lady. She received the Early Career Award for Engaging the Public in Science and Technology from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In addition, she has recently learned that the American Educational Research Association has awarded her an Early Career Award. Folks, you cannot imagine how reading this long list of distinguished attributes, what damage that does to my inferiority complex. <laughs> Seriously, let's give a warm Golden Panther Worlds Ahead welcome to our distinguished guest.
Thank you for that very kind and thorough introduction. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And thank you for inviting me here. Um, it's always really such a pleasure for me to have the chance to come kind of out of the neuroscience lab and really think together with people who are on the ground making education happen about what I believe to be one of the most complex and important problems facing humanity today. Because if you think about it, every other problem that faces us as a species around the planet, every other problem is in part dependent on our ability to educate our children to think well. Our ability to solve cancer, our ability to, to you know, solve wars, our ability to uh, you know, learn languages and get along with each other, and any other number of problems that could come along that we haven't even understood exists yet is dependent on our ability to have global citizens who can actually think and work in ethical and creative and cognitively complex and emotionally grounded ways. So I feel like this is one of the hardest problems that faces us. We don't really understand what the space of the problem actually even is sometimes. And it's one of the most important ones. And it's one of the most difficult ones. So, you know, my hat's off to you as educators for working in this domain. Um, I wonder if a tech person wants to turn off that microphone, because I'm noticing that it's, um, it's picking up reverb, and I don't want to walk too close to it and squeal everybody's ears. Yeah. So I'm going to sort of jump right in here. Um, you have a sense of what I do based on, my, based on my bio. So what I study is an aspect of, of the human mind, which I think is sort of one of the pinnacles of what it means to be a human being. I study the kinds of complex social and cultural emotions that have been largely neglected, almost completely neglected by science, but that I feel are among the most important mind states that we can cultivate as human beings. And for me, to try to understand from a scientific perspective, from a psychological perspective that honors kind of the nature of meaning making and subjective experience, and also from a neurobiological perspective that constrains the way in which we theorize about how the mind is doing this, it teaches us about the basic mechanisms that undergird our abilities, that by bringing these together we have new insights into emotions like inspiration, like awe, the kinds of emotions like compassion that form the basis of our morality. These emotions are critical to thought. They're critical to humanity. Because any number of cognitive theories, without grounding them in a sense of usefulness, without noticing how the world needs you and how your skills and your innovations can actually change the way in which other people live their lives and the way in which the planet goes forward into the future, if we can't match our skills to the needs of our culture and of our planet in ways that we decide to be ethical and future-oriented and valid, then we're, we're, we're doomed. So to me, these emotions are among the most critical things that we can be promoting in an educational context, but we've uh, hardly studied emotions like admiration, which I find uh, uh, really to be extremely uh, uh, fascinating. And so I'm going to start the talk just by kind of unpacking the title, because the way in which I wrote the title, and I know it's not exactly the same title that was on the poster, forgive me, I'm sorry, I changed my mind. <laughs> it's my prerogative, okay? Um, I, the way in which I've designed the title is a way, it gives away the basic logic of why and how we can bring neuroscience to inform the study of education and of learning. You know, you, as teachers, you don't need to know, and as educators and as policymakers and as parents, you don't need to know what little gyrus is doing what in the brain. You don't. You need to understand how a person's mind is developing and how cultural and social shaping of that mind and how cognitive experiences of that, for that mind are actually building that person into a more competent, more ethical human being over time. But. What I would argue is that even though you don't need to know what each little gyrus does, there is something very fundamental that neuroscientific evidence can teach us about the nature of the mind that's very relevant to education and to policy and to parenting. And that is 
that it turns out that you know, it was thought for a long time in the history of neuroscience that we have, you know, people noticed very early on that we have a brain that the bottom part of it, you know, the brain stem, down, you know, the spinal cord comes up and then you have all this sort of, you know, densely packed sort of low level stuff, that this bottom part of your brain stem, which is involved in managing your survival in the basic physiological sense, making you conscious rather than uh, in a coma, you know, that monitors your physiological processing, that keeps what we call homeostatic uh, balance. So it makes your body have the right amount of oxygen for the amount of exercise you're doing and the amount of emotion you're experiencing. It makes you eat. It makes you affiliate with other people in appropriate ways. It makes you stay out of the mouths of tigers and off of the edges of cliffs, right? These very basic physiological functions for our biological survival have been known for a hundred years to be shared with vertebrates all over the planet, right? It turns out that, for example, alligators have a really beautiful one of these brain stems, even more, even more developed than ours. And so it was thought that this brain stem, this low-level stuff, which I'll show you in a little bit, is, you know, it, it's known that this is the seat of our physiological survival. If you get damage in this region, you get all kinds of very profound disturbances to consciousness, and, and many of which are incompatible with life. So these very basic systems that we share with other animals, and then we notice we've got this huge, gorgeous cortex, this gigantic, you know, mushroom of wrinkly stuff all over the top of it that, you know, is more developed and more uh, specialized and bigger for our body size in us than in any other animal. And we know that this cortex is involved in all kinds of high-level, uniquely human thought language spatial processing, all these very complex things. It's our ability to do, con you know, to do all these very, very complex things, like to be inspired by another person's virtue and our ability to do calculus, right? And so it was sort of thought for a long time that the way in which this system evolved is that we have a kind of basic biological survival system that we share with other vertebrates, and that's true. And then over the top, we've developed this massive amount of computational power that allows us to think about all kinds of complex things that are divorced from the rest of our survival, you know, that the brainstem is kind of going along, keeping us alive, and monitoring our, our body for us so that we can now engage in these high-level kinds of thinking that are so, you know, that we're so uh, proud of having so much more of than other, than other animals. You know, if you ever look at a picture, sometimes when I teach this to little kids, I'll put up a picture of a child, sort of smiling at the camera head on, and a picture of a, of a chimpanzee looking at the camera head on. And if you look at a chimpanzee versus a child, the chimpanzee's head ends right above their eyebrows, right? And the chi human child has this big, high forehead. What do you think is back there? You know? Please wear a bike helmet, okay? Okay. What we're finding now is that that model of the nervous system in which we have a kind of layered design, where we have a basic survival-related kind of brain, and then over the top of it is high-level processing, and these two things are separate from one another, that that kind of model is really not how the social mind works. That instead, what we're finding is that the reason in which our emotions and our sociality and our complex cognition, our desire to devote our lives to be mathematicians or physicists or whatever it is, the reason in which we care about these things, we feel that kind of intrinsic sense that, you know, I can't prove it, but I sure feel like this is real, like it really matters, you know? And like I want to spend my time on this earth doing this, okay? That that sort of subjective uh, meaningfulness, that sense of purposefulness that, that is really the most important aspect of being a productive human being, in fact, is not limited to the cortex, but instead, is recruiting and co-opting and reorganizing basic biological systems for human survival that reach all the way down the brainstem as far as we can see in the field of view of an fMRI scan and scanner to the top of the spinal cord. That it turns out that our social survival, our ability to think complexly about the cultural knowledge that we have in our world, the reason why you go to school, and our physiological survival, the survival of our bodily organism, are at this late stage in our evolution completely intertwined with one another. We don't have a separate brain to do complex thinking. Instead, our embodied brain, our brain which 
whose original purpose is to control our survival, to make us, you know, like I said, not fall off of cliffs and all these kinds of things, that that same brain that has a basic job to keep your body alive is at the same time as doing your bodily survival, also supporting your social mind. And so what we can learn from this then is if we want to understand for education how various kinds of complex cultural cognitive knowledge are transmitted and how they're being supported by the mind and what they actually are in their essence, what we can do is actually map those functions onto the brain not just because it's a fun exercise to light up this gyrus so or that gyrus, but because then we can analyze what the basic embodied survival-related homeostatic mechanism is that that region of the brain manages as its kind of day job. And that tells us something about the logic of the social and cognitive mind. The social and cognitive mind did not get mapped on as a sort of separate thing. We have a math area. No, we have an area that is involved in all kinds of spatial representation, including not tripping when you walk and keeping your arms and legs in space in a way that you're not going to you know, bump into somebody else, and that measures you know, the kind of manifest quantity, and at the same time that does things like uh, understand social hierarchy, right? Who is sort of uh, uh, should be kind of deferent to who. All these kinds of skills are mapped into the same region because the basic underlying logic of that region is in essence to support certain kinds of cognition that have an embodied job, keeping your arms and legs in a coherent place. And I'm going to show you this in some of our data as I kind of take you through. And we can learn about the nature of emotions like inspiration and compassion by using this logic to analyze our data. So I'm going to start the talk with this painting by Margaret Lazari. She's a, she's a good friend of mine at USC. She's a professor in the Fine Arts Department. She's the chair of the Fine Arts Department. Um, and she painted this huge, in real life, this is a huge, beautiful seascape, six by eight feet or something, in this vibrant colors. And if you kind of squint and look into this seascape that she's painted, in the middle you can see these kind of white squiggles floating, right? And to, to me they look like, you know, waves. My daughter thinks they look like clouds. What, what they actually are is neuroimaging data from one brave woman's uh, brain. She came into our lab and allowed us to take pictures of her brain. And then what we did was we we stripped off all the little cells around the outside of her cortex, all those little neurons in that thin sheath around the outside. You know, we, we stripped them off the, the picture, not the lady. <laughs> Just making sure. You never know what people think we do. And we stripped them off. And then what's underneath is this massive interconnection of tiny microscopic but very long fibers that communicate between neurons. These can have as many as 200,000 connections in one of these axons. And these connections are sculpted into amazingly complex networks that we're only just beginning to understand. These networks were really only discovered and described in you know, 2006, 2007. Okay. And so we're understanding now that you know, when you look at this painting, what you're seeing in those white squiggles is kind of the sum total of all the network connectivity of one woman's brain, of one woman's self, right? By virtue of her genetic uh, endowment, by virtue of her experiences, cognitive and emotional and, and educational over the course of her life, by virtue of just chance sometimes, these networks have been sculpted into a whole massively interconnected with billions of connections. And what I love about this painting as a metaphor for how and why we study the brain in education is that rather than kind of painting the brain in a bucket in the corner, you know, the way that we often think about brains, you have a little kid who comes in here or an adult who's coming in here to learn and you got Maria here and she's got an X kind of brain, like she's a, you know, whatever kind of brain, fill in the blank, dyslexic brain, happy brain, you know, Latino brain, I don't know, whatever you've got. Okay? And then we're going to sort of take that person with that brain, and we're not going to pay attention to what's from here down, and we're just going to have this little brain there, and we're going to put stuff in it. 
You know, we know we don't learn like that. That's not how people learn. Think about the last time you learned something difficult and interesting for you. Whatever it is, in a school or an academic co context or in a real life context, you made a decision that you really had to inform before you could decide. How did you come to that decision? Did it feel like somebody put the answer in your head? Or did it feel like you were, you know, building something over time? And so what I love is that Margaret's painted this brain, all the connectivity of this brain, sort of floating in this seasonity of life. She's got the sun shining down on the top to warm it. She's got it kind of sloshing back and forth in the tides of our culture and our society and our times. She's got little weeds growing up through the bottom of it. She's got little red fish swimming by to represent the spontaneity of our creative ideas. And that is how I think about the brain. That is how I think about the brain, as an embodied, acculturated, social organ. That's the most complex system known to human beings. So, I mean, what's that a picture of? It's a mother and a baby. It's not me. I never put pictures of myself in my family. It's my sister. <laughs> so I'll tell you what this is a picture of. This is a picture of my sister meeting her new little daughter for the first time. And Nina was the smaller of two twins, and she was born in an emergency C-section when my sister and the twins were under general anesthesia. So this is the first time that they've actually met each other when they're both awake. And Nina is about three and three quarters pounds here, about two hours old. And there are many things that we could appreciate about this photograph, but the reason that I put it up for the purposes here is to show you the interdependence of our biological and our cultural and social and cognitive development. These things are totally intertwined with one another. They're different aspects of the mind, yes, and we can study them separately as separate dimensions, but in a real person, these things are completely interdependent and intertwined. And, and so if you think about what Nina's doing here, and about what my sister's doing here to support that, right? She's looking at her, so Nina comes to the world with an innate biological reflex built into her visual system to stare at two dark dots in this kind of configuration, right? You put them this way and they don't look anymore. You make them too far apart, okay, too close together, anything like that. But it's a very undifferentiated basic reflex that's built into the structure of the visual system to recognize dots like that. You can use it, you can elicit it in any number of ways, with fingers or anything else. It's very undifferentiated at first. But that basic biological predisposition forms the entry point into her first social relationship. Because my sister recognizes, not consciously necessary, but is recognizing that you know, Nina's in a conducive mindset, so to speak, to be, uh, to be engaging this reflex in a productive way. She's not hungry, she's not cold, she's not sleeping, okay? And so they take advantage of that context, and my sister is supporting every other thing about that baby survival that she can at that moment that isn't relevant to engaging that one skill. Because Nina's just only two hours old, and you know, one thing at a time, please, you know? Right, I can look at you, but I, I can't, you know, open my hands at the same time. That's, that's just too much. I can't hold my head, you know? The whole body is completely supported in every way. And you know, did somebody take my sister aside and say, you know what, remember, newborn babies don't foveate their eyes very well. They don't have very good visual acuity when they're first born. So, you know, the optimal distance for, for focusing their eyes is about, you know, eight to 10 inches. So to get out the ruler and really optimize, you know, so we can really start this baby out right on the, you know, track of life. Of course, you know, of course not. How is it that my sister is, is holding Nina at just the right distance? I mean, Nina is, Nina is demanding, in a sense, that she do that. She's showing my sister what she needs. Because as my sister's holding her and interacting with her, Nina is kind of giving off signals, not consciously, She's giving off signals that, well, I don't see anything. Oh, there you are, right? Oh, it's a little too far, you know, right? So, so my sister is just in, naturally, by being responsive and attuned to the baby's skill level, is adjusting the context so that she can support it optimally 
for Nina to do the one thing that she can engage at that moment, which is to look into her mother's eyes. And, you know, guess what? This way of learning, of engaging from a place of biological predisposition or basic biological endowment, but then eliciting that within a social and a cultural and a cognitive frame via the support of the world around you. That doesn't stop when you're, you know, three hours old or two weeks old or 24 years old or 89 years old for that matter. This is the nature of our human mind. Our human biology at this stage is so cognitively complex because we are so socially interdependent with one another. Our very biology is a social one. And if you think I'm being metaphorical, think of the really poignant but really heartbreaking work of like Chuck Nelson and Nathan Fox and their colleagues in Romanian orphanages, right? In Romanian child-rearing institutions where people leave off their infants whom they can't raise. And uh, they, they had a, uh, basically they had a grant to try to, from the MacArthur Foundation to find as many foster families as possible. Um, and they assigned uh, children as they came to the, to the, uh, to the institution were left off. They assigned them by picking their names out of a hat. I mean, it's heartbreaking, but by picking their names out of a hat to either the institution or to a foster family. And then there was another group of kids who were raised in their own biological families. And then they followed the kids over time. And the kids living in the institution were being supported by the MacArthur Foundation. Their food was being given to them, their baby formula, their diapers. You know, the heat for their building, the toys that they had, right? They had the material things that babies need. But what they didn't have was high quality relationships with caregivers who were committed to them and who loved them. They basically had a rotating staff of nurses who come in every eight hours and then leave. And what happens? What happens is not just that you have sort of children who grow up to be kind of cognitively delayed, socially inept, you know, emotionally dysregulated, you get 17-year-old kids who are three feet tall. Your biology does not grow in the absence of adequate social stimulation and relationships. That is the legacy of our intelligent mind. Our mind is not intelligent to solve random problems about astronomy. Our mind evolved to be intelligent in order to work together with one another and to evolve to understand complex social com uh, uh, relationships and problem solving so that we can specialize and so that we can work together in more complex systems. Throughout the animal kingdom, the, in general, the more, especially in mammals, the more intelligent, the more intelligent a creature is, the more socially inter interdependent they are. And so the big lesson, that's my little nephew, that's Nina's older brother. <laughs> the big lesson is that we're learning that feeling emotions, and especially emotions about the sort of mental world, about the inferences we make, about the moral space in which we live, not just, not just emotions about the immediate physical context, like I'm scared because there's a snake about to bite me, right? But emotions about, you know, your dedication as teachers to the world's children. I can't see that just by looking at you, but I can infer it based on the fact that you're here and you've got these intent looks on your faces, right? Feeling those kind of emotions involves the brain systems whose day job it is, and they do it at night too. Somebody once asked me that. I'm just, you laugh, but somebody did ask me what do they do at night, so I, you know, I, now I just always say it. Okay involves the brain systems whose day job is to regulate and maintain the survival of your organism body, of your physiological body. And this is literally true. I'm going to show you some of the data. The very same neural systems whose job it is to maintain consciousness as compared to coma are the brain systems that are activated when you feel inspired. And when people tell us in an interview I feel like I just might, like I just, what kind of person am I? Who do I want to be? I want to do something to help. That kind of intangible sort of sense that I should act. This is, this is useful. This is meaningful. I want to be somebody and help out with my time on this world. I don't want to waste it squandering it, right? 
those kinds of states are not just activating cortical systems. Of course they're activating cortical systems because they involve all kinds of cognitive meaning making in language. But the punch that sort of subjective state comes from activations that are all the way down in the systems that keep you alive. Our social survival and our biological survival are completely intertwined in the humans. But you can't pull this apart. This is why, if you're under chronic stress in a relationship, you get stomach aches and ulcers, right? Why should, you know, being worried about something make my stomach not function well? The food I ate is perfectly good quality. There's no reason why that should influence my, my bodily functioning, right? Why should my immune system go down when I'm in exam period? Right? Because your mind is preoccupied. And because that preoccupied cognitive mind is the same brain that's managing your immune system. It's like, sorry, you know, using up the resources. <laughs> so feeling emotions involves the brain systems that basically feel and regulate your body in the most basic sense. And Meaningful learning always involves emotion. It's neurobiologically impossible to learn something in the absence of emotion. There are very, very weird cases called absence automatisms that were described, they're a very weird seizure disorder that was described by my mentor, Antonio Damasio, 30 years ago. And that's, so far, the only case we know of cognition without emotion unmotivated, profoundly unmotivated cognition. People who just sort of, when they get into this seizure state where they have a disconnection between the regions of their brain, they kind of walk around the room aimlessly, they're sort of vacant. That's why you call them absence automatisms. They aren't there in their sense of themselves being present. But they're moving around like a body in, you know, without a spirit, kind of. And they're just sort of moving around and, you know, they see a Coke and they pick it up and drink it. They, you know, walk over to a window, they look out, they just engage these kind of automatic actions. And then eventually the seizure goes out and they sort of wake back up, if you will, and kind of become aware of themselves. And what happens? Well, first of all, they don't remember anything that they did. Why shouldn't they remember what they did? Because that cognition was totally unmotivated. It was completely vacant of any kind of self. It had no reason for being. There was no motivation behind it. There was no... There was no sort of emotion in it. They look completely blank. They look like automatons. That's why Antonio called them that. You know, sometimes, to a lesser degree, our students look like that, right? <laughs> That's not good. They are not building memories. And so now I'm going to kind of skip ahead. I'm going to kind of skip ahead to a more to a more sort of complex version of the same thing that I've already introduced. And here what you've got is a young man from one of my experiments at USC, and I'll tell you, I sort of put my scientist hat on and kind of tell you a little bit about how these experiments go. So at first, when I went to work with Antonio and Hannah Damasio, you know, they sort of sat me down at the beginning of my postdoc and said, well, we are really interested in studying social emotion. You know, the emotions people have about other people. And I said, gee, that's terrific, because I'm really interested in that, too. And they said, great, can you go figure out how to do that? Because nobody's ever really done that. Okay, I'll go give it a whirl, and this is what I can come up with. And we had all these fancy ideas about how we would induce emotion states, right? And none of it worked. We almost gave up, actually. Until one day I came to a lab meeting. I still remember this. I sat down, and Antonio said, you know what? Mary Ellen's presenting today, but let's just, this isn't going anywhere. Let's just, you know, let's try something different. Let's move into a different topic. And I said, you know, just a minute, Antonio, can I just, can I just present for 10 minutes? Let me just, I came up with something. What I did was I told him a story. I told him the story of a woman that I had known, a woman who I had been friends with for a while. And this woman lived in Sudan. She was a native of that country, and she had been born in a very, very rural, arid part of Sudan, where her family group sort of was nomadic, and what that meant is that she and the other kids in her generation really had no opportunity to go to school. They, had, uh, they were illiterate. Uh, they had no opportunity to get routine medical care. Right? There's something like one physician for 16,000 people in that part of the country. And what it meant for her is that 
she found herself, when she was 13 years old, she found herself alone with her mom and her baby sister, or mom went, her mom went into labor with her baby sister. And she basically stood by and watched as her mother and her sister died in front of her. Because she had no way to get information about what to do. She had no way to get help from, you know, any kind of physician. And as she began to make meaning out of that experience, she knew she had heard of doctors, and she decided she wanted to be one. But she had never even been to elementary school. And then two years later, when she was 15 years old, she heard of a family from Cambridge, England, two professors, the parents, the mom was a sociologist, and the dad was an anthropologist, and they came with their two school-age girls to rural Sudan to do, to, do, uh, to do research for two years. And she basically walked to them and presented herself and said, as they say in Africa, I, I want to be your house girl. I want to work for you and clean for you and take care of your girls and you know, show you around my country and everything while you're here. And so they hired her on. And every day, as those two little girls would sit down with their British school books to begin uh, doing their, their studying that they had brought with them, she asked them to show her what they were learning, both as a way for them to understand it better and as a way for her to learn. And over the course of those two years, those two little girls taught her how to read. They taught her the basics of how to do calculation and math. And when the family was due to return back to England, they were so taken with her that they offered to support her if she wanted to come back with them and leave everything from her country behind for a while so that she could pursue her own dream of educating herself. And to make a long story short, she went off to England with them. She went through the British education system as a young adult. She went through elementary school, on through secondary school, and into university. She eventually went to medical school. She became a fully trained and certified obstetrician and gynecologist <coughs> in Europe. And at that stage, she could have stayed in Europe and led a very affluent life and still worked for the cause of her native Sudan, but she didn't. She returned to Sudan, where she now operates a mobile health clinic for women, where she travels into the most remote regions of the country and teaches women how to care for themselves and each other during pregnancy in the prenatal and postnatal period and during childbirth. So I ask you to think for a moment, how does that person's story make you feel? And we're, we're kind of a big group to shout out answers, but if anybody wants to, you know. Anybody inclined? Inspired. Inspired. What do you, what do you mean when you say inspired? Um, first I felt really sad, and mm -hmm. uh, then I had a feeling of, wow, this, this person took all of that and turned it around for, for themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I guess it made me feel uh, kind of uh, sad because she could have lived a very uh, uh, comfy life and instead uh, she went and, and didn't because uh, she was really scarred by what, what she witnessed, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you mean? determination to push themselves and to help others mm -hmm. that people like that exist and we can look up to them and admire them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to uh, educate her and to, you know, pour in into her potential. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, one more. Okay. Well, the fact that she started, she, you said at like 15? Yeah. She started from that point. It's yeah. amazing. You know, like, I, here in school, like, we complain about all the things we have to do, for example, to get to med school. Yeah. The fact that she started all the way from elementary, yeah. it makes me feel like what I have to do is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, extremely yeah. expiring. <laughs> exactly. So what you all basically just gave away is something that Antonio and I had not appreciated when I set out to study these emotions. And that is, that in studying the emotions we have about other people's minds, 
What we're actually studying is exactly what you just said. It's the feelings that we have about our own life. It's our ability to reflect upon our own life and to compare it to other people's lives and say, well, if she could do all that, then, I, you know, oh, gosh, me getting to med school is nothing, mm -hmm. right? Or, gosh, the, it's possible to have a mind like that. That makes me very hopeful. That makes me admire her and want to be like her. And so what we're finding is that it's just like that little picture of Gil, my nephew there with the mirror at the beginning, right? Where he's looking at his mother taking this picture of him via a reflection of himself. We use our own self as a platform in which to understand, from which to understand and appreciate the social and the cognitive world. And then what that means is that over time as we become more developed and more educated, it, it's kind of like, you know, the way I think of it is, is Gilbert's little mirror there becomes kind of like a fly-eye mirror. You know, you've got a thousand different perspectives that you can hold on to and relate to one another and think in more and more complex ways about what you agree with and what you don't agree with and what a possible other alternative might be. And so what we're finding neurobiologically in these data is that, in fact, these kinds of metaphoric or linguistic constructions around self are not just limited, you know, when we're reacting to other people, is not just limited to the sort of verbal domain, but it actually reflects the real neurobiological activations that are supporting our ability to engage socially with the world, that our, our basic mechanisms for maintaining consciousness in the most basic sense of self, consciousness as compared to coma, as compared to being asleep, are the same mechanisms that are activated and that are involved when we appreciate or are inspired by another person. Think how, how poignantly that speaks to the role of educators and parents in children's lives. You are potentially, your relationship with a child is potentially shaping not just sort of their mental development in a kind of abstract way, but really the essence of who they are and what they're capable of feeling like and how they experience their own self. And so to, to demonstrate this to you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you forward and show you some data from another young man from one of my experiments who's reacting to a story like this one, a different story. This story is one that, don't tell him this, but it's meant to induce compassion. Okay, the last one was meant to induce compassion that moves into inspiration, right? So it ends at a note of, 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 of hopefulness and positiveness, whereas this one doesn't. Um, so I'm sorry if I bring you all down with that. But, um, and what I want you to understand when you see his reaction on videotape is how his reaction is in essence just like Nina's engagement with her mother, right? Where she can, she can engage a biological embodied mechanism, in her case for looking at dots, in the service of a cultural and social relationship in order to build a cognitive skill that facilitates her becoming a more developed human being, a more capable human being. And what he has as a, as a young adult, he's a college student from USC who volunteered for my experiment, what this young man demonstrates is the same process. But now he's such a developed, advanced, mature learner that he can actually engage these kinds of biological mechanisms and self-related mechanisms and learn from them turn that back around to kind of heighten his own awareness of his own self in social relationships, even in the absence of actually having to interact with the person. So instead of, we've moved from some, your mother actually holding every single aspect of your body for you so that you can engage, to a place where he can sit at a table on the other side of the world and hear a story about a guy in China and have a kind of vicarious reaction to it, a sort of vicariously kind of social relationship with that person that teaches him something about his own self. So he's reacting to a story about a young man in China. Um, we did this experiment in China and in the US at Beijing Normal University and, and at USC. Uh, and so we designed some of the stories to be about people in China. They're all true stories. They're all, none of them with actors or anything. They're all real. It's ever so much more compelling to inspire people with real people's stories than with pretend ones. Um, and he's reacting to a story about a young man in China who was born during an economic uh, real uh, downturn in the city where he lived, an economic depression. And when he was, uh, just a few months before he was born, his dad passed away, and it was just him and his mom. And his mom lost her job during that economic depression and ended up working two jobs as a laborer to be able to support them. And she often didn't even have enough money to be able to feed him enough. 
And, you know, he always grew up telling his mom, someday I'm going to be an architect and I'm going to build a beautiful house for you, mom. I'm going to take care of you and everything. So he grew up, he went to school, he did all this stuff. He went off to university eventually. And during his first semester at university, his mom passed away just because she was still working two jobs as a laborer, right? To, and, and he kept on going to school and he just, uh, by chance, made a friend in one of his classes who was a, a docu studying documentary filmmaking in one of his arts classes. And that young man was making a film about, for a course project, about the conditions in that city in China where that other young man had grown up, right? And he was going through the university's film archives in the library, finding footage of interviews that were taken then to make a, a little documentary short. And amazingly, he unearthed a video footage interview of the other young man's mom explaining what it was like to raise her son under those conditions when he was about eight years old. Of course, she had never told her son she did this interview, right? Somebody stopped her in the street and asked her what, it was, you know, what she was going through, and she just told the story. And she's telling the story about how one day she was walking to get her son from school at like 3.30 in the afternoon, and how she was in the middle of February, and it was sleeting and snowing and freezing cold, and she's all wrapped up, and it was raining on her, and she's all wrapped up, and she's going to get him from school, knowing that she didn't have any money to buy him any food to bring, and he hadn't eaten anything since 6.30 that morning and what that felt like to her to be going to get him, knowing that she couldn't bring anything. And then, as she was crossing the street into the school, she saw in the, you know, in the slush in the middle of the street, there's something glittering, and she stopped and picked it up, and it was like a, you know, a 25 cent coin. Kind of. And she realized it was money, and she ran off to a street vendor, and she bought all these warm cakes, and put them inside her coat to keep them warm, and she goes running off to school to get him. And she describes when he comes out of school and he sees her, he says, Mom, what's the matter? Do you have a stomach ache? Why are you holding your coat like that? And she says, no, no, look here. And she opens her coat and shows him. And she describes the look on his face as he sees these cakes and he starts eating them. And then he stops before the last cake and he says, but Mom, you know, you haven't had any. This one's for you. And she says, oh, no, 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 I already had mine. These are the ones I had saved for you. And he says, oh, great, because these are the most delicious cakes I've ever had. And he eats the last one. So what this young man in my experiment has just watched is the video of the young man in China <laughs> watching for the first time that video footage of his mom telling that story. It's you know, very compassionate inducing. And so you'll hear me ask at the beginning of the tape, how does this person's story make you feel? Which is the only question I ask people in this experiment. How does this story, person's story make you feel? And then people explain their answer. And then we move the person into the fMRI scanner, and we hook them up to all kinds of psychophysiological recording equipment. So we're measuring ECG, so that their heart rate, we're measuring their galvanic skin response, you know, the microscopic amounts of sweating in the bottoms of their feet and stuff. We're measuring their respiration and their facial EMG, the, the musculature of their face. And we're measuring their neural activity as we ask them to think again about each one of these stories and to tell us in real time, as soon as they're aware of their feeling, to tell us how they're feeling. And then what we do, so I've kind of put my scientist hat on now, what we do is we analyze people's behavior in the interview, the words they use, the gestures they use, the emotions they express, the meaning they make, cultural differences, individual differences, to analyze and to make meaning out of the patterns of reactivity in the, in the brain and body as people are experiencing particular emotions. So we're trying to look for patterns of correspondence between certain kinds of neural activity, certain kinds of embodied reactivity that correspond to experiences. And we see cultural differences in how neural activity corresponds to experience. We see individual differences in how it corresponds, and we're trying to study the nature of subjective experience. How is it that we build a, a, you know, a feeling of our emotion, as Antonio would say? So I'm just going to play this video for you so that you can kind of get a sense. And what I want you to be thinking about as you're watching is where the kind of biological, basic, physiological modulation is coming in and where he's then moving from that into a very cognitive place of gathering up the information that's relevant and leaving behind the information that isn't and inferring from there something about the psychological qualities of the protagonist's mind and then from there he kind of turns it back around onto his own self into using his this realization about somebody else in order to really understand what that means he bounces it off of his own life and self in a kind of reflective way and comes to a new realization about his own 
about his own relationships. Um, this is all that's hit me the most, I suppose. And I'm not very good at like, verbalizing emotions. I just, I don't know, I think my brain just not wired that way. But um, I know I'm feeling like physical sensations. So this one is like, like there's a, a balloon or something just under my sternum. Mm -hmm. like, inflating and moving like up and out, mm -hmm. which, I don't know, is like my sign of something really touching. Um, and so like, like the selflessness of the mother, and so like, like the selflessness of the mother, and then also of the little boy, you know, having these like wonderful cakes that he never gets to have, mm -hmm. and it's still like offering them to her. And then her turning them down is, uh, and it makes me think about like, like my parents because I don't, mm -hmm. they provide me with so much and I don't thank them enough. I don't think I know I don't. Um, so I should do that. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> When I show this at neuroscience conferences, nobody ever laughs. <laughs> Just, you know, cultural difference. <laughs> so, you noticed, right? There's all these kinds of, he begins with this sort of physiological, like I've got this balloon in my chest, you know what I mean? And that's my sign. And from there, he starts extracting the meaning from that. It's almost like he's saying, I don't know how I feel yet. I just know that I've got a very big embodied reaction going on that tells me this is really important. And from there, he constructs a kind of psychological meaning. Okay. Warning. <laughs> we are about to look at brain data. And I put up this warning. This is my daughter's jack-o'-lantern from a couple of years ago. I, I put up this warning because I think it's a really nice time to kind of pause and think about what brain data actually teach us and how we should be making meaning of them and how we should not be making meaning. So I like this jack-o'-lantern as a sort of visual metaphor for this problem. Because if you look at this jack-o'-lantern, you know, you, you can't see the candle that's inside there. You can't see the, 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 the warmth and the light and the heat directly, that source. But what you can see is the way in which it's shining out. And you can infer things about the, the physiological, if you're sort of segueing into people now, you can sort of infer things about the nature of that inside experience from biological markers, from the person's reports of their experience, from their behavior, from their demeanor. And that is what we're doing with these experiments. We're trying to understand something about the nature of that candle. But notice that studying that candle and trying to test basic hypotheses about how it works and how it shines does not put the candle out, right? It does not diminish the candle in any way. To the contrary, as a scientist, I think it, it, it elevates the candle. It makes us appreciate ever so much more the beauty of how it functions. And so I just want to lay that on the table before we begin talking about the neurobiological mechanisms that support self, that support motivation and purposefulness and inspiration and virtue, that these, that these mechanisms, by trying to test them and understand how they're mapping themselves onto more basic survival mechanisms that our, body is, that our brain is already doing, it teaches us a new way to appreciate the nature of the human mind, but it does not diminish the mind in any way. And it doesn't explain it away. Okay? Deal? So what we found is literally that feeling emotions about other people's mental states, emotions about that woman in Sudan, emotions about that man in China, engaged brain areas, like I told you before, that are literally there to feel and regulate your own self and your own body. This was at the cortical level and at the subcortical level, you know, up high and also down in alligator territory. So I just want to point out to you a couple of basic neural hypotheses that we wanted to test. 
And that, these have now been uh, verified in many, many experiments. But in 2009, when this came out, you know, like, like you heard, this won the best paper of the year. It was a very, very interesting insight. And I feel like the data kind of fell in my lap. But we first tested, we were first very interested to look. This is, so let me just tell you what you're looking at. This is a picture of one woman's brain who was a subject of this experiment. And then we're going to take all the data from all the times that 17 different people <laughs> went into the scanner and said to me, over the course of a hundred tries, I'm watching this story and I feel really moved by it right now, and we're going to compare all those, what's going on in the brain then, we're going to compare that to where blood is flowing when the person says, I'm watching this story, but I, I don't, I don't, I'm not really getting into it. I, I mean, I do understand what happened, I think it's really great that they made this charity organization, but I wouldn't say it's hugely inspirational, it's kind of, you know, it's a nice thing, that's good. Okay? And, our participants didn't know this, right? But there were stories built in that were true, interesting stories, but that weren't meant to be as inspirational or as compassion-inducing. And so then what we do, and this is the way of many, many neuroscience experiments, we're now coming up with other kinds of ways to analyze these data, but early neuroscience experiments, and many of them still, use a kind of subtraction paradigm, where what I'm showing you is a statistical map of all the places in the brain where there's reliably more blood flowing when the person says, I feel really moved, then when they say, I don't feel really moved. But what this also means is that everywhere else in the brain that I haven't painted orange is as active whether or not the person says they're really moved. So I'm not showing you the parts of the brain that are doing the task. I'm showing you the parts of the brain that are relatively extra involved when a person feels subjectively inspired or compassionate as compared with when they're engaging with a social story of equal complexity and interest, but that they don't feel inspired or particularly compassionate. Does that make sense? And so I could move these results all over the brain depending on what control condition I put. If I have solving calculus problems compared to feeling compassionate, I'm going to get a whole different set of results, right? And so that's something you really have to understand when you see orange spots on brains on the cover of Newsweek and stuff. You know, the X region does this. Well, the whole rest of the brain's doing it too. It's just it's doing it the same amount for whatever this is and for whatever their control task was. And that's essential to understand. So as a neuroscientist, I can't make the results you know, change. I mean, I'm, I'm showing you the actual data, but you also need to know how I calculated it for you to be able to really appreciate what the results mean. <laughs> so we were really interested. First of all, this is, so this is a picture of the one person's head through this way, right? You can see the tongue and the nose, right? And this is the spinal cord. We were really interested, this is a picture of the same brain through this way. Okay, so it's like the person's like this, okay? Um, so you've got the, the forehead up here, and this is the back of the head back there, okay? We're very interested in these big pieces of cortex. This is the high level stuff that, you know, mice have a whole lot of, but alligators don't, okay? And this is another view, this is from Gray's Anatomy. Um, the, the textbook, though, okay, not the TV show. Um, yeah, so eyeball goes here, okay, and if you sort of peel, there's a sylvian fissure here, a naturally occurring crack, and if you kind of lift it apart and you can see underneath, there's this big piece of tissue that you saw sliced through before, right? And if you look at the anterior part of this, the front part, up in the dorsal bank, or up in here, okay, we've known for a very long time the basic embodied job that that cortex does. And we learned this from the famous experiments by Wilder Penfield and other people, other neurosurgeons. Basically, before they had neuroimaging back in the 1950s and stuff, they tried to map out a functional map of the brain by taking advantage of um, the opportunity to study patients who were undergoing open brain neurosurgeries when they were awake. So they asked people, would you like to participate you know, in these experiments? But also they were using the data to be able to do a safer surgery on the person, saying, you know, try stop talking now, Mrs. Jones. Can you still talk before I take this out that's causing your seizure? Okay, right? So what, what Wilder Penfield and his colleagues did is they mapped out a kind of rough functional geography of the cortex by sort of poking and stimulating in different places and seeing what happened, what the person reported. Okay. So when, when they poke up in here, I know, some of you know I know <coughs> what happens. <coughs> Excuse me. So basically, you poke around up here, the person vomits. Or they get other kinds of, you know, gastromotoric responses that I you know, will describe. 
And what we were interested to know is when people feel compassionate, when they feel inspired, right? This guy said, I have this balloon in my chest and it's blowing up and out, and you know, or I have this rock in the pit of my stomach when I got that news, right? Poets have been describing these sensations for millennia. Are we literally using visceral somatosensory cortex, the brain systems that feel and regulate our digestive system in our guts, in order to engage with social emotions about another person's mind? And then we had another bunch of hypotheses. And I'll just sort of broadly state them. We were interested in understanding what was going on in here in this sort of light gray stripe. This is that part we share with alligators. This is called the brainstem. And you know, we're up in the middle of your head. You know, this part is way in the middle because it needs to be very well protected. You do damage in here, you've got profound disturbances of consciousness and self and survival. In this midbrain region here, what we've got is densely packed little nuclei whose job it is to basically uh, uh, maintain physiological regulation, breathing when you're asleep. Okay, making your heart beat, all these kinds of basic things. Hormone regulation, arousal regulation, okay, all these kinds of things and other things. All the way down into here, this is the spinal cord down here. And just above the spinal cord, we have this little lump called the medulla. The medulla is so low, it's the lowest part of our central nervous system. <coughs> if you get damage in here, we can't even keep you alive on life support. Short of defibrillating your heart with every beat. You become completely dysregulated. You don't breathe. Your heart does not beat. We wanted to know when people feel inspired by another person's virtue or compassionate about their mental pain, are we actually changing the activity in these survival-related systems? So this is a map of the findings turned orange by my fancy statistical software. And what we find is that, in fact, it's true. When people felt compassionate or inspired, they are literally activating this anterior dorsal insula, which is where I poke and you puke, right? Sorry. Hey, you know, got to keep people awake here. It's, you know, it's, it's dinner time, OK? And all the way down here in the midbrain, in particular regions that you know, we can sort of understand, particular sets of nuclei in the midbrain whose job it is to manage your physiological survival. If you get danger, if you get damage in these regions, you get coma or persistent <laughs> vegetative state or uh, various kinds of profound problems with your ability to stay awake and alive. All the way down into the medulla. If you get damage down here, we can't even keep you alive on life support. And this is the bottom of the picture. Think how profoundly this speaks to your role in children's lives and in young people's lives. When we feel engaged with another human being, when we feel inspired by another human being and that kind of purposefulness and motivation that comes with that, we, this data suggests that we are literally activating systems that are responsible for our bodily physiological survival. That we're changing the activation of those systems in accordance with our social meaning making. And so emotions and their you know, primitive counterparts, something like biological drives, hunger, sexual drives, basic things that make organisms survive, right? Sleep-wake cycles, serve to keep organisms alive. I mean, that's what they're there for. They keep you out in the front of buses, and they make you have infants and all this kind of stuff. But human survival has become a very social and cultural construct. It's no longer merely enough to physically survive. If you don't have people who love you and care for you, you end up 17 years old and three feet tall. And there was another really interesting finding in these data. And that comes from cutting up the, the remember I told you, no matter how, you know, how I show you a comparison, 
what I compare the data against is going to completely change what the results look like, right? So we can ask a different question of those data. I just showed you emotion versus not very emotional. Now I'm going to show you something else. I'm going to show you, so these are, first of all, all of the emotions that were in the experiment. And if you look on the left-hand column, we have compassion for social or psychological pain. That's like the guy in China, where there's no physical pain. You're not seeing him in, you know, his body is in no harm as he's sitting there watching his mother. The pain that you, that you see him having is a, is a psychological or a social internal one. Okay? But we compared it with, you know, but compared with compassion for physical pain. There, you know, it, it's all about physical. You see somebody step off a curb and snap their ankle, right? And these are all real stuff. It's amazing what you can get off of YouTube if you type in ouch as a keyword. <laughs> okay. And we've got the same kind of split over here, only these feel rewarding. These feel satisfying, these kinds of emotions. Emotions like admiration for virtue, admiration for the woman in Sudan, right? As compared to admiration that's about the here and now. I don't need to know a whole lot about this person's mental qualities and capacities and cumulative set of circumstances to appreciate that she can solve a Rubik's Cube blindfolded by memorizing it. Or that this nine-year-old can play Rachmaninoff on the piano, or whatever it is. Okay? And what turned out to be a more interesting contrast than emotions about pain versus emotions about reward, which is what we had originally thought, is cutting the data the other way. Taking emotions that are about the mind and showing how they're different from emotions that are about the physical context around us. Make sense? So what I'm going to show you now is a contrast of all, everything that happened in all the trials in the, in the scanner where people were feeling one of these two emotions, which are about social and mental circumstances, like admiration for the lady in Sudan, compared to when people were uh, feeling emotions about physical things that are about here and now, we don't have to make a lot of inferences about the person's mental qualities and capacities to be able to appreciate what's going on in that videotape. And what we found is that those two kinds of emotions, about minds and about context here and now, were related to different neural activation patterns in systems that are way down deep in the back of the cortex, in the back of the head in the middle. And I really think that this actually was the distinction that was most important in that paper that I'm just showing. Because this system allowed us to understand how it is that we actually build from our own self and scaffold from our own embodied experience in order to be able to understand and appreciate other people's situations. So what we found is that this area in orange to red was more activated when people were having emotions about other people's physical and cognitive circumstances, you know, breaking their leg, solving a Rubik's Cube blindfolded. What do we know about this region? What we know about this region is that it's, it's right in the middle next to our, you know, it's the inside surface of our parietal lobes. It's the part of the brain that, as its day job, its embodied job, is mapping the state of your arms and legs, body, and space and time. You know, you have a left leg right now but you're not kicking anybody with it, even though you weren't consciously probably aware of it until I just called your attention to it, right? I hope. Thanks to your, this region and your lateral parietal systems, you were keeping it in your own space very nicely, and you weren't tapping anybody with it, and you weren't sitting on it in a way that hurt, okay? So we use our own physical body map as a way to appreciate other people's skills and pains, and this area was activated during emotions about other people's social and psychological circumstances. It's a different area of these self-related systems. What do we know about this region? We actually didn't know very much about this region, but we're starting to get a lot more about it. What we, what we had known since 2001, when Mark Rakel and his colleagues decided to do an experiment, is that this region is heavily activated when people are, quote, not doing anything in the scanner. You're just relaxing. You know, please go in the scanner. But you know, we want to study the brain's so-called default mode. So don't think about anything. Just, just stay there. You know, eyes open, eyes closed, whatever they've done different ways. And then, okay, take a break from that. And I'm going to give you really hard math problems to solve. Okay? And now, okay, no, no, just think about nothing. Okay? And they wanted to see what the default state of the brain was. And what they found was that contrary to expectations, there were massive activations in the most metabolically expensive regions of the brain's core and some regions on the lateral sides that also uh, are involved in attention. 
the, the, the parts of the brain that are involved in memory, the parts of the brain that are involved in representing here your visceral internal conscious self, a kind of map of what's going on in your internal self. How could it be that you could have huge massive activations in a part of your brain, in, in several connected parts of your brain, when you're not doing anything? And these become profoundly suppressed as soon as you start working on something really mentally difficult. Well, now we realize that, duh, when you're laying in the scanner doing nothing, please, right, for seven minutes, you know, for the first 15 seconds, you're doing nothing, I'm doing nothing, I'm still doing nothing, right? I'm just, I'm just doing nothing. And then you start, you know, your mind starts to wander. You start thinking, geez, I got my grandma's birthday party next week. I really need to do something about that. I wonder if that guy works kind of mad at me. You know, he looked at me on the way out today. Oh, and I do need to think about, right? You're planning your own life. You're daydreaming, you're prospecting about the future, you're thinking about the past and your memories, and you're kind of chewing on them and kind of making meaning and distilling stuff out of it. And what we now know is that these regions of the brain that are activated when you're sort of default, when you let down your outward attention and you don't work hard on some kind of outward task, these come online. And these are not just sort of daydreaming regions, but these regions are involved in all kinds of abstract and moral thinking. They're involved in any kind of thinking that doesn't limit itself to the physical here and now context. I can't you know, tell from looking at you the information I need. I need to infer it. I need to you know, engage it in a kind of more uh, internally focused, memory-driven way. These systems come online, but they become suppressed in activation as soon as you pay attention to the outside world. These kinds of systems are active when you're resting or when you're internally reflecting, but they're suppressed when you're you know, listening to me right now. You know, you're not deeply making meaning of what I'm saying. You're going to be doing that on the way home as you're sitting in a traffic jam. You're sitting there paying just enough attention that you don't crack into the car in front of you, but sure, you know, you're thinking, geez, that naughty lady's talking about that. I don't know why. What was that? Does that relate to anything I knew before? And you're chewing it over in your mind, right? But I ask you, and we have a, if you're interested in these ideas for education, we wrote a paper in, uh, in uh, uh, Perspectives on Psychological Science that came out in 2012 called Rest is Not Idleness. That's about these results and other people's results now too, and their psychological implications for kids potentially. But what, what does this mean? And this is just a set of hypotheses that I'm throwing out. This is what neuroscience is good for. It's for giving us new hypotheses about what we should be thinking about in education. It can't tell us what to do, but it can tell us, hey, you might want to think about it this way. What does this mean for children who live in urban environments? You're saying, Johnny, keep your head out of the clouds, watch where you're going when you're walking home from school, do not let anybody be following you, don't step into the street until the walk light goes, pay attention, you know, don't take your keys out till you know nobody's following you, okay? Does Johnny, you know, as an adult, I can walk down the street and not step into the street until the walk light goes, you know, with minimal amount of effortful attention. And I can be chewing on all kinds of stuff about my grandma's birthday party at the same time. But when I'm nine, I probably can't be. Are we systematically building a generation of kids? We know that the brain is organized by how we use it, right? The brain is like a muscle. The way in which you use it is shaping the way in which those floating white connections that Margaret painted are organized. Are we building a generation of kids who don't have adequate opportunity because they're always being entertained by their cell phone, it's always dinging, their iPad's always in front of them, they're out here all the time gathering information, right? Not something, it's a great way to get information when you need it, but then you need to be able to disengage from it and know that you're not going to be interrupted so you can kind of go into that space. How many creative, you know, how many ins insights have, have come about, you know, while people were, you know, taking a shower or going for a walk with their dog, right? Kind of put the body on autopilot and all of a sudden the stuff starts happening. Are we systematically, you know, raising a, a generation of children with, who are all about thinking in this space, about physical and cognitive attributes and what people are doing and saying and here and now and what they look like, as compared to... Uh, being able to then disengage from that and think about the moral and psychological and social and prospective, like what, what does it mean for the future, what does it mean for my memories, kind of space. And do we care? You know. I'm just going to let you chew on that for a bit. <laughs> Those are my kids. Um, and what I'm going to show you now is just a little bit of work, because I know a lot of you are in early childhood education. 
And even if you're not, we all start as little children, so let's just all appreciate that. <laughs> just a little bit of work from my kids that kind of shows us how we see some of these ideas. And this is segueing from neuroscience into kind of, you know, fuzzy developmental sort of analyses, okay? But nonetheless, I think it's a nice demonstration of what this can look like in real kids' work. And this is a song that was written by my daughter when she was about, I don't know, five and a half or something, six, I guess she was six. And, you know, she's drawn herself here in a little cute dress and all this stuff. And by the way, she didn't really have a real pink dress. This is just, you know, her making it up. And, you know, she's got a little music stand and whatever, you know, a little cultural knowledge about what we do in our household. Okay. And her brother's name is Theodore, right? We call him Teddy. And she sings this song, which I will just read it. I won't sing, okay? Um, and she says, Oh, Teddy, we love you more than the whole earth size. As the earth size, because we got a little little tone. As the earth spins every day, we love you as much as usual, but sometimes even more, as you make us proud and happy that you're you. So I got a question for you. Is, is this a, a song or a poem about one little girl and her family's love for their little baby brother? Or is this a poem and a song about one little girl's budding knowledge of planetary science? <laughs> right? Oh, oh, yeah. Relationships, cognitive knowledge. Yeah, she was six. Okay. And this is from my son, a very different kind of thinker. Okay, but still, the same idea, the same sort of, I need to represent my knowledge within a social relationship. I just am driven to do that as a human being. Because that's what it means to know something and to be proud and be connected to my cultural sort of, you know, space. I mean, of course, he didn't say it like that at each time, okay? <laughs> just so you know. So this is a little card that my son wrote for us. And this is the front, a picture of the front of the envelope, you know, he's got mom, dad, little faces in the den, and he's got little people and hearts and little trees and all kinds of stuff. Teddy, you know, oh, it's so cute, okay. And this is the inside, age five, right? Not quite as literary as his sister. That's okay, that's okay. We're, we're good. We're different kids are different, okay? He's got little hearts floating around. Dear, oh, sorry, screwed that up. Dear mom and dad, all capitals, period. I love you, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Theodore, exclamation point. I mean, we don't call him Theodore on a daily basis, but he, you know, he figured, and he told me this, you know, this is, this is a formal document here. This is, you know, this is, a, this is a letter I need to represent myself properly. You know, none of this nickname stuff. We're going we're gonna to do this right. I'm, I'm writing a card. All right, very nice. And this is a picture of the back of the envelope that the card came in. So I said, you know, hey, Ted, tell me about this. You know, being a good developmental psychologist and all that, I thought I wouldn't presume. So, you know, he said, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's instructions for how to open an envelope. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, well, so I made it in two colors. Blue is like, you know, the, the, the kind of like high level instructions, and then black is kind of the procedure that you do. And, and so, okay, so when you want to open an envelope, you know, the place you want to focus, I put a little box around it, you're going to want to focus right on this point. That's the part that matters. And then you see this blue arrow right down there. That's it. And then what you're going to do is you're going to stick your finger in the side and lift the paper up and up and up. And that is how you open an envelope. You know, guess what? I already knew how to open an envelope. And I think he knew that I did. Why does he do this? Because as a child, part of having cultural knowledge, part of what it means to engage with learning is to represent that learning in the space of relationships. To show the people that you care about what you know how to do, and to use those skills in order to make connections between people. This was a card to me. This is a message to us about, you know, what you need to do to read this little card about I love you, Theodore. Okay? All right. And so meaningful learning in, in the complex sense, in the real sense in which it happens in schools and in the world, is not a rational process in the sense of being divorced from emotion or relationships. 
it's not a disembodied process in the sense of being separate from being controlled with separate brain regions from the ones that maintain your physiological survival. And it's not a lonely process in the sense that Vygotsky meant it. It's an acculturated process. You're experiencing and building these skills in the context of a cultural set of values and norms and relationships. And that starts narrow when you're really little. It's like Bronfenbrenner said. It starts narrow when you're really little and it gets broader and broader. And as you're older, now you have many cultural spheres. You have a sort of a school one and you have a friends one and you have a different friends one with your boyfriend or whatever. And then you got one with your parents, you know? You're building these ways of experiencing yourself within these frames. And that's where learning happens. It doesn't happen separate from who and where you are in the world. I'm going to skip this stuff. Well, oh, we have six minutes. I can put a little of it. This is just a this is just a little demonstration I threw in there to say if you think this is all about touchy feely like relation stuff, but I teach physics, you know. This is a PhD student from Sao Paulo, uh, uh, Guillermo Brockington, who came to do his PhD with me at USC, and he's doing an experiment. He did an experiment with expert physicists. And, you know, these are postdoctoral level or above physicists. These are people who've dedicated their professional lives to studying physics. And then he has novice physicists who, you know, have taken some physics in college, but, you know, that's that. And then he showed them representations, diagrams of objects moving in the world, things falling out of airplanes and doing stuff. And some of the diagrams are sort of scientifically correct, and some of them represent misconceptions of how people think things, objects move in the world, but they're not real. And then he hooked people up to ECG and GSR. He's measuring the sweating on the bottoms of their feet and all this kinds of stuff. And what he found is that when you show expert physicists objects falling out of airplanes the proper way, compared to some kind of scientifically misconceived way, they show, literally in the milliseconds after they recognize that image, they show microscopic changes in the polarity of their sweat at the bottom of their feet. Right? A measure of autonomic nervous system activity. It's like, you yeah, know, that's my world, you know, that's, that's how things fall out of airplanes. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm with that, you know, that's part of who I am. So even though they don't have, you know, their social relationship with their mother is still connected to their physics knowledge, the way that Nora's is literally, my daughter's literally is, her ability, you know, her ability to represent um, her love for her brother is tied to her ability to represent the fact that the world's a really big place. You know, big feeling, big world. Okay, good, that makes sense, right? <laughs> Here they become divorced from each other relatively, but I would argue that even disciplinary knowledge, even cold cognitive disciplinary knowledge, like how, you know, for physicists, knowing how things fall out of airplanes, is inherently tied into our physiological ability to arouse our own body, in the most basic sense, and that that was originally elicited as a relational construct, as a social construct. So even if our knowledge now is no longer social, it bears the legacy of our social relationships and our social learning in children. That's why you become a physicist, because you care about it, you love it, you think it's interesting, you think it matters. Let's get that. And so from the, from the perspective of affective and social neuroscience, you know, you could say that the purpose of education is, in essence, to increase children's abilities to recognize, and adults' abilities, right, to recognize the complexities of situations, to notice that this isn't just about how that lady twisted her ankle, this is about how we treat other human beings in our society, right? Buying that apple at the supermarket isn't just about, you know, buying the apple right now, it's about the fact that, you know, hey, in my case, I live in you know, California, we grow apples, I don't need to get apples from Argentina, okay? And to help children have more sophisticated and nuanced strategies for acting and responding when they notice that things deserve attention. And this holds in the social world, it holds in the physical world, it holds in the domain, in the academic world. This is, in essence, what we're able to do when we acquire complex skill sets. Whether you're a, you know, an emergency room physician, or a teacher, or a, you know, a good grandma. You're noticing what's going on in that domain of expertise, and you've got skills for acting and responding in it. And you notice when 
something doesn't matter and you should overlook it, right? I don't stop to make big, you know, weighty decisions about whether I'm going to buy the Cheerios every week, you know? Do we need some? Great. Into the car. Okay? So emotions might be automatic responses to situations in the sense that we don't control the sweating on the bottoms of our feet and our heart rates and our breathing rates and all that consciously, but we need to learn how to feel our emotions, how to make meaning out of those embodied reactions, and how to have the appropriate embodied reaction. How to cognitively appraise the world in ways that make complex inferences appropriate with the current context. And so before I close, I just want to put up a little plug for this free online course we made. It's, all these materials are available to you. They were paid for by the Annenberg uh, uh, Learner Media Foundation. And you can um, find all kinds of stuff about the brain and learning and social and emotional stuff for classrooms and teachers working with these ideas and all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, so feel free to go there and poke around. And it's like designed to be at the master's level, but you can, you can use it for various things. So I'm just going to close with a brief excerpt from a poem. I think oftentimes poets and musicians and artists, they can't give us the scientific data, right? They can't give us the evidence, but they often understand and can point scientists in the direction that we need to go by showing us what we need in order to improve society. What do we need to know? What's going on here that they sense that we need to go try to find some answers for? And I think that Stanley Kunitz has really done this with this poem. This is a, an excerpt from the poem called The Layers. Stanley Kunitz was the US Poet Laureate twice during his lifetime. And he, uh, he died recently at the age of 103. And he was 98 years old when he wrote this poem. And he's writing about what it means to him to have lived his life. And he says, I have walked through many lives, some of them my own. And I'm not who I was, though some principle of being abides from which I struggle not to stray. And you know, to me, I wish I could go back and talk to Mr. Kunitz about this interpretation, but you know, I can't. But to me, this poem speaks very deeply to the purpose of the work that I showed you about human emotions and the nature of human life. Having a life is not a kind of disembodied, abstract kind of process. Having a life, to live a life, is to walk through a life, to be embodied in that life in an active way, rather than in a passive sort of floating way. I move myself through the space of my life, and I don't just walk through my own one life. I can have as many lives as I can appreciate having. That's in essence, the purpose of education. I can have a, a, a physics domain of life, and I can also be a literary expert domain of life, and I can have friendships kind of life, right? I can have ever so many different ways of experiencing and living my own self. And I can even live for a little while in the shoes of a woman in Sudan whom I'll never meet and I never will meet. And from that, that process changes me. I'm not who I was, he says. Though, you know, there's that activation in the bottom of my medulla, you know? I mean, sorry, that's the geeky neuroscientist in me, but I see that and I think that is the essence of your survival. You are listening it, you are eliciting it in a social way as in addition to it in terms of your own physiological basis. You need to hold on to that or you lose who you are. Thanks. Right to seven, so everybody should feel free to go. If there are anybody who does want to ask questions, why don't we let people go uh, who want to leave, and then I, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to stay for a few minutes and ask questions if that's uh, answer questions if that's okay for the room. Okay. Oh, sure. Uh, hold on a second. Yeah. I think people want to all listen. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question about um, 
When you were gathering your data, did yeah. you find differences? Um, I'm interested in people who are bilingual, trilingual, bicultural, oh, yeah. or uh, different genders, or things like that. Yeah. Did you look at things like that, and did you find differences? So we, okay, so we have what I think are really interesting. They're, the, the scientific data are so labor-intensive to collect, so that, that we can't be like exploring a million things all at once. But we have very, very interesting patterns of results for how um, brain activity in the insula, so the, the part of the brain that's feeling your guts and sort of regulating your autonomic modulation during emotion, is corresponding to people's experiences across cultural groups, like so in China versus in Los Angeles, Beijing versus Los Angeles now we have, um, and in young Latino uh, teenager, uh, Mexican-American immigrant kids in Los Angeles uh, versus young uh, uh, immigrant kids in Los Angeles from East Asia, right? We find uh, very striking and robust cultural differences, not in the amount of brain activation, not in the emotions people say they feel, like the, the, the strength of emotion they say they feel, the quality of emotion can be somewhat different, but what we find is that the ways in which those brain activations cor correspond to a person's real-time report of their experience is systematically related to culture. And it's also systematically related to how people behave in the interview and how people talk in the interview, the words they use, for example, the gestures they use, how expressive they are. So what we think is happening is that there's this complex interplay between individual and cultural differences in how people behave and think and feel, and that those are actually shaping over time the way in which you build experiences from your own you know, emotional reactions. And so what that tells us in the most basic sense is that the social world, the values and norms of our society are teaching us how to experience our own self. They're teaching us how to interpret and build a subjective, you know, sort of life out of the reactions that our body has. But there's ever so much more work to do. Yes? Hello? Okay. When you were talking about um, inspiration, I couldn't help but think if the same part of the brain that controls our ability to control our limbs is also affected by inspiration. Is it possible that this could be um, attributed to the body activating a sort of response similar to fight or flight? You know, inspire. Uh, yeah, move. that's a oh uh, yeah, that's a good question. So so there's kind of a lot of ideas embedded in that. Those are really inter interesting questions. So so first, the, the the part of your brain that was activating for limbs, kind of body map and space and time was activating not for an inspiration for virtue, like for the lady in Sudan, but it was activating for emotions that were about people doing things in front of you that were admirable, like, wow, that's so cool, I didn't know you could break dance like that or solve a Rubik's Cube like that. And so what we think, and by, by the way, there are also striking cultural differences in how that plays out. That's one of the slides I skipped. There's striking cultural differences in, in how that embodied activation plays out. So what we, what we think is going on is that people are using, just like little you know, Gilbert with that mirror at the beginning, right? people are using the feeling of their own self, simulated feeling of their own self in their brain, as a platform on which to appreciate what somebody else has accomplished. And so yes, these are very complicated and interrelated um, systems. Uh, fight or flight is kind of a different, sort of lower level, uh, subcortically driven response that's associated with a much more basic pattern of, of physiological responding that then, that this, that, that's already come and gone by the time we get to this more complex emotion. But for sure, these things are not independent of each other. These things are embedded and sort of um, built into one another in a kind of scaffold and increasingly complex way. So it's a, it's a really interesting question. It's just hard to thoroughly answer it in a short space of time because these are actually layers of neurobiological mechanisms that allow us to respond in a very, very quick and dirty kind of way as compared to sort of building a more complex understanding and appreciation for somebody's, for somebody's uh, more, you know, significant set of actions that are sort of culturally appreciated. If you don't know what a Rubik's Cube is, you have no way to know that that's something cool to watch. You know what I mean? Yeah. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay. Hi, um, thank you very much for your presentation. Hi, um, I'm, a, um, I'm a music ed major here at FIU, and one of the questions I have is since 
within music and the arts in general, many students are attempt to find themselves in the arts, yeah. but also express themselves in yeah. the arts. And my question is, how, how can we take these concepts that, um, that you've given us and kind of be much more sensitive to the, the way our students' minds work regarding to the content that we um, give them? H how can we kind of bring those concepts into our classroom environment, but, or maybe even reform our lesson plans and activities? What a great question. <laughs> Only that? Is that all you want to know about? <laughs> oh, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> um, you know what? The, the short answer, um, but I think it's the, it is the question. And that's, and by the way, that's a question that science cannot answer, right? That's a question that science can inform how to be more efficient. But what we value in a classroom, what we want for our children to experience and live, is it's a question of sort of societal debate. It's not something that can be informed by evidence. I mean, it can be at a certain level, right? Um, but it's really something that's something we decide that is good, subjectively good for our children, and so we engage it. So, um, but, but what I would say is that in order to appreciate the complexities and the, the nuances and the variability in and the cultural ways and individual ways of knowing that the kids in your classroom have, what you need to do is build curricula, or I should say, think about your job as a teacher not as a job of exposing kids to things and giving them stuff to do, but instead as a job of orchestrating and designing a context that's age appropriate for the kids. So it might be a very sort of physically oriented context for little kids, it might be a mental abstract context for older people. Right? Orchestrating a context that is optimally you know, suited that is very likely to produce, to, to elicit in the kids an interaction or a construction mentally, an experience that is the one you want them to have. So rather than thinking about how do I give this knowledge to the kids, think about what could I set up for this lesson that kids would come and interact with in a way that they're really likely to do something that's constructive toward the goal I have for them. And then you're also leaving room for kids to come in at whatever place they're at. And so the next step is, as you start to engage the kids in the lesson, as the kids start to construct things, you become almost like a, 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 a researcher in your own classroom. You're using what you know about the goal, about what you're hoping they're going to be experiencing, not as, a, you know, a, not as something that you give to them, but instead as sort of a way to um, assess from them, in their own words, in their own creations, in their own actions, whatever it is that you get from them, depending on their age, that you can use that to assess what kinds of experiences are they subjectively having? What kinds of mental actions are they engaging in? Or physical actions are they engaging in? And what are, are, are those moving them toward the goal that I had in mind for them? And so what you're doing is, is thinking about giving kids the power and and the, um, the, to have ownership over their own engagement in, a, in an activity, and then asking them in whatever way is appropriate, given who the kids are, right? Asking them to show you how, what, they, what meaning they made of that activity. And then you adjust the context so that they learn. Think about you know, my sister with that little baby, right? She's, there's, there's so much implicit in that photograph you know, that was happening 15 minutes before it was taken. The baby probably ate, and now she's, you know, she pooped, and everybody changed her, and she's warm, and she had her nap, and she's all good, right? All these things were set up so that she could engage that one action, and it's completely, you know, supported. So your job is to kind of provide the support and to adjust that support. You know, where do you see best, Nina, right? And then let the kids show you what they need and let them experience and then adjust based on that. Does that make sense? So teaching is a super duper hard job. It's a very skilled profession. And it's a job that is, it's almost you know, overwhelmingly difficult. Your job is to kind of try to get inside the minds of all your learners and see what are they experiencing and how can I set up the world for them so that they're more likely to experience it the way that I need them to, to be able to get where we're going. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Can give it to the lady in the green turnips. Hello? Yeah. Um, so my question is uh, that as an early childhood uh, 
or soon to be an early childhood educator. Mm -hmm. uh, for the I know that the development is crucial between birth and eight. Mm -hmm. And I always would like to inspire my students to, you know, do whatever that they wish and in their interests, mm -hmm. you know. But seeing as how neurons end up slowly um, dying, or not dying, but stopping. Oh, they do die. Event well, yeah. yeah. Uh, what happens if, let's say, I have students, I've, some of them, that I'm not sure exactly if I have inspired them or triggered that inspiration spark. And like, for an example, my brother, um, he's 20, and he had a very difficult time finding an inspiration for what he would like to do mm -hmm. in society. So is there like a, a time that like all of a sudden inspiration no longer really, or, or starts to die from, from that stem? Like, I don't know if I'm making my question clear because like... I yeah, are you asking, and so I understand your question as being sort of about kind of sensitive periods of development. Right. And so, you know, you know, you're losing capacities, the more, so you can think of development as a process of, of um, shaping and sculpting your abilities. And whenever you shape and sculpt anything, you're losing possibilities, you know? Like, I have put a heck of a lot of work into becoming a neuroscientist. So, you know, it's kind of a bummer, but I really can't be an architect at this point. You know what I mean? Um, and, and that's just sort of the, the trade-off that I live with every day, you know? <laughs> I'm joking. But you, you get what I'm saying, right? So you think about, and, and yes, it's true, massive amounts of neurons die over the course of, of, of early childhood, and you need them to. If you don't have that kind of pruning, you have all kinds of, you know, developmental delays and, and profound retardation that's associated with that, right? The brain, more is not better, necessarily. You can think about brain development in, in early life as like, a, as like growing a garden, right? More and more and more plants in your yard does not make a pleasant place to be, right? You know, you have to have paths, and you have to have, a, you know, a shady spot, and maybe a sunny spot, and, you know, the big tree, you don't want to be growing something that needs sun underneath it, right? You have to, you know, sort of, it's about the way in which things are functionally sculpted and organized. And once you grow that big tree, that's a beautiful, gorgeous tree, but forevermore, you know, sun-loving plants cannot grow in that space, you know? So it's really about trade-offs in plasticity and efficiency and trying to hook kids into owning their own future and giving them the power to live their life. You're just there to sort of, you know, set up the, the, the context for them and help them regulate when they can't and help them see things they're not capable of seeing yet. But your job is not to live their life for them. You know what I mean? That's, that goes for parenting too. And so you, you let them engage and you steer them and you support them and you let them own it. And that's where inspiration comes from. What people have to understand is that inspiration is effortful to conjure. It doesn't just happen to you, right? You build it by thinking. You build it by being you know, committed to something, by putting in work. And so what you need is kids who have the self-discipline and the abilities to engage themselves in the stuff they care about. And then to go from there, and the flexibility to sort of move and engage in ways that matter to them. Just the, the fact of having had an experience of being an expert and of caring about a domain. You know, this, there's lots of work from like Harvard's Project Zero and stuff that demonstrates this. You know, these kinds of project-based learning where kids are engaging in ways that it doesn't really matter what the topic is, you know. Just because you studied, you know, you know, dogfish when you were in kindergarten doesn't mean you're going to be an oceanographer. It doesn't matter. But what does matter is that you've had a little taste of what it feels like to understand some aspect of something and to represent it to your peers. And that's where inspiration comes from. It comes from that sense of ownership. It's some of that drive that's deep down. And you can't give somebody that, but you can set up the context so that they can build it for themselves. Does that answer? So you next, and then I guess we'll get to the room. Yeah, OK. So with your experiment and all the things that you connect with, I was wondering, I had an experience when I was tutoring kids, a six-year-old, I was tutoring her in math. and. Yeah. It was because she was having difficulty concentrating and she wasn't doing yeah. her homework or whatever. And oh, the mom was like six. Jeez. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the mom was telling me that she was thinking of taking her to the doctor to, you know, get her diagnosed with ADHD and like giving her medications. And I'm yeah. thinking, um, she's only six. You know? Yeah. It's completely natural for her to like kind of go off on tangents while we're doing some kind of homework, you know, because she's already in school all day. Yeah. Oh, and how yes. much damage that would do if she's taking amphetamines at such a young age. Yeah. And then I was wondering too, like, 
with those experiments you were doing and like the whole scatterbrain uh, part of the brain like you know where like, they're just like in the shower like you were saying and then they're focusing on something and that part of the brain is activated can't that be used to like exactly diagnose ADHD so there are differences we can't use this to diagnose anything yet because there's so much natural variability in the healthy world that to know where a disability starts. I mean, you, you diagnose these disabilities based on people's ability to engage in their life effectively. So uh, the way I think about all of these disabilities um, is really as not so much a broken kid, but as also a broken world. It's a mismatch between the kind of inclinations the kid have and the kind of expectations that the world makes on the kid. And when those things don't align well, you get, you know, name your syndrome, okay? Right, so if I'm a kid whose brain is not inclined toward making, you know, to taking uh, uh, symbol shapes and mapping them onto sounds, which is a highly unnatural thing to do for the brain. If I'm a kid whose brain isn't cl inclined toward that genetically, and you stick me in a place where, you know, decoding text is the way to get information, well, bummer for me, right? That's not going to work out very well, right? Or if I'm a person, you know, who's kind of clumsy and, you know, everything in school is about ballroom dancing. Well, I'm really the LD kid now, aren't I? You know, I'm in the corner tripping over my own feet, okay? So really these things are relative. And we need to understand that these things are not disabilities in the sense of being something wrong with the person. They're differences and they're problems because they're a mismatch with the context. So we need to try to understand and think about, well, how can we orchestrate the context so it's more conducive to this child being able to engage appropriately? And also we need to have a really good developmentally appropriate understanding of what kids at different ages are sort of, you know, normatively capable of doing. What's normal development look like? Because for every skill you're developing in math at age six, you've taken away playtime on the playground that was a different kind of skill, right? And it's a balance, and we need to think about what do we really want for our kids? Um, I'm not saying that there aren't kids who don't benefit from medications if they really have an imbalance that's, that's troubling them. You know, my sort of hallmark for, for children with this is that if the kid doesn't like taking it, it's probably not good for them, right? Kids, lots of kids really fight these medications. And to me, if they're fighting it, it's because they sense that that's not the real them when they're on it, right? So we need to do more work to make the world a place they can be. Whereas some kids who really need it find that it helps them hugely to be able to engage the way they want to. And so in those cases, it can be very helpful. But we don't really understand the, you know, how these things work at the level of neurochemistry, not really. So you know, you're kind of taking a risk. That doesn't mean that these things aren't helpful, that you know, this is not the Middle Ages. If somebody has a medical problem that we, that we can treat, we treat it. Um, but I think we also have to think a lot about what's realistic for a six-year-old's attention span. You know what I mean? And why a kid needs to be learning that much math at age Six. If you think that's going to mean that they're going to be farther ahead when they're eight or 15, it, it's not true. It's like saying that little kids who walk at nine months instead of 11 months and, you know, are better sports players later. They're not, right? It doesn't make any difference. I mean, if you're not walking at two and a half, we've got a problem on our hands, right? But if you're, you know, if you walk at, you know, 11 months or 15 months, it doesn't have anything to do with your motor ability and your skill later when you're, when you're, when you're a child or an adult. You know? So we really need to think about what we mean by learning and what, you know, what kinds of skills we want to develop for our kids because for every skill like that that they're developing, you're narrowing and shaping and sculpting that garden in ways that are going to be set. And that's taking away the possibility spaces for them to do other things. You know? And we always have to think about these things as trade-offs. And sometimes we, we deem that they're, they're, they're necessary enough. That we, that we say, well, in our culture, you really have to know how to follow logically to code, or you're going to have a terrible time. So we're really going to spend a bunch of hours a day for 10 years of your life making sure you got this, because it matters that much to us. Okay, that's the decision we make. But, you know, that's going to have other kinds of implications. We know that, you know, literate brains versus illiterate brains, for example, um, you know, where you can still find people who haven't learned to read, but who have normal social and cognitive lives. Okay, these aren't people who were, didn't learn to read because they were disadvantaged in some way, but people who didn't learn to read because they lived, you know, um, in very remote areas, in cultural groups that don't read, right, or something like that. That we see striking differences in the ways that their brains are organized for social cognition and the ways they're organized for language comprehension. You know, we're shaping our brain and changing it and limiting it as well as making it more efficient in some ways. It's always a trade-off between, you know, sort of plasticity and flexibility on the one hand and and, uh, and automaticity and efficiency on the other hand. So we need to really think about what we want for our children. 
that good? I think we've been here for a while. I'm happy to stay as long as you want to, but I don't want to make people feel rude to get up. Oh, yes, one more. Okay, one more. Anybody needs to go, please go. Yeah. So, so uh, these are the same brain systems that map proprioceptive information from the, from the body, but that does not mean that their activation during these emotions is actual, real, is reflecting real information from the body at that moment. It could be a kind of simulation of actions that's allowing us to appreciate somebody else's action, and that, in fact, that's what we think is happening. Do you see what I'm saying? So, uh, so these brain regions, I mean, the very nature of this is that we can see how, uh, we can look at how activation patterns are corresponding to people's experiences and to real embodied responses and try to map out that these systems are doing multiple jobs at once. And the activation pattern that we see doesn't allow us to tease those apart. So, so in another, in another uh, brain region, um, so first of all, before I answer the rest of the question, you're not a neuroscientist, are you? No, not really. Okay, because then I'm going to answer it at a more technical level. But, so we've done studies in the anterior insula, in this region that feels and regulates your guts and stuff. And we're also, and we're asking people how they feel, and how strongly do you feel right now? And we're also asking people to tell us, or we're also measuring people's embodied reactions, like their heart rate, okay, and their increases in their heart rate. We can show that in China, in Los, you know, Beijing, in Los Angeles, in Asian Americans in Los Angeles, we can show that the activity in the anterior insula, the dorsal anterior insula, and the ventral is tracking heart rate. Okay, it's tracking the body. So we know that it's actually sensing the body. And then we looked at, so this paper's under review right now, okay, so it's not out yet. But then we looked at how people, how strongly people are saying they're feeling right then. And we can show that the variance in, that, 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 that same brain region is tracking how strongly people feel. Trial by trial. Right now I feel really strongly, we're getting more activation there. Okay, I don't feel so strong, we're getting less activation there. But what we can show is that the variance that's due to heart rate is separable from the variance that's due to feelings and they don't correlate with each other. In other words, the brain, that same brain region is doing two jobs at once and those two jobs are, are relatively separate. It's the same brain region, but it's both tracking heart rate and tracking feeling strength at the same time and those two things are uncorrelated with each other. And then we can show that there's no cultural effect on how the, heart is, how the heart's being tracked in the brain. Of course there isn't. That's a basic physiological function. But there are striking cultural differences in how the activity is correlating with feelings in different cultural groups. See what I'm saying? So what we've shown, and this isn't the same region that you were talking about, but what we've shown is that you can look at and analyze the activity pattern in one neural region and take apart the pieces that are due to interoception, feeling the body, from the pieces that are due to psychological processing and show that there are differential effects on those two layers of processing that are simultaneously happening in the brain. The brain is an extraordinarily complex organ. I mean, it can't be doing one thing at a time. You know what I'm saying? And when you were talking about the brain stem and then the areas that are activated and that are engaged, uh, particularly when uh, you were doing those experiments, mm. Oh, the reticular activating system? Yeah. That's, that's part of what happens. Also the paraqueductal gray and other kinds of mototoric nuclei. We don't see uh, sensory regions. Like there's, there are distinctive patterns of activation that we see in the brainstem. But those are difficult to study because, as you probably know, um, the brainstem is, is moving with physiological artifact, right? So the brainstem is moving as you breathe. It's moving as arteries going up into the brain are pulsing. So it's difficult to locate these activations precisely. But what we can show is that when we regress out the effects of physiological data, right, the heart rate, the breathing, and everything on those brainstem regions, we can show that these activations are systematically greater when people are feeling systematically stronger than when they're not. 